right, everybody. Well, thanks for uh, for joining us here. Uh, my name is Michael Tucker. Uh, just kind of diving into the uh, to a, a, a live impromptu kind of presentation uh, here on virtual Marketo user groups, and um, just want to kind of give you a little bit of a background. I've been away from the community for a little bit here, um, really since last summit. But um, back in 2018, when I really started kind of working for myself uh, for the uh, for the first time, I really got involved in these uh, virtual user groups and, and that was my first intro into the community. And um, so I thought that that would make kind of an interesting experience for you all to get kind of a sense of, um, of, of what we were doing to be able to initially launch the manufacturing virtual Marketo user group, which I'm you know, the proud uh, leader of that group for Marketo. Um, and then, uh, you know, kind of give you some, some tips and text things that we learned in that process, um, kind of where that was at the beginning and, um, and, and you know, before we started that group uh, and, um, and, and kind of where we've evolved since then too. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to just kind of mute and let, until you're talking. And actually, that's that's an important piece uh, of this is that um, uh, we're using Zoom for this recording. Uh, and one of the learning lessons that we've had in some of our sessions, so I'll tell you a little bit about some of the things that happen behind the scenes as we're doing some of these recordings that you can uh, see if you go on our YouTube channel um, of some of the historic uh, virtual user group sessions that I've been running, um, and, uh, and 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 it'll help you to be able to avoid some of those those hiccups, if you will, for your sessions when you try to move your Marketo user group into a virtual format as well too. So hopefully that's helpful, and we'll do um, kind of an open discussion at the end of this. And that way, if you have any questions, I'd like to be able to record those too, and and then that way other user group leaders and and other marketers that are looking to do kind of virtual content uh, will have that as a as a reference to be able to help them in this transition as well too. It's, it's it's sort of a different animal so there's a lot of learning that's that can be done here. Um, so let me dive into this and, and, and kind of go from there. So really what we're doing again is, is we're, we're going to go through a timeline and, and really my perspective is as I started out in the community in late 2017. I think it was November or December 2017. Um, so you know can't really give you much uh, I've been working with Marketo for a couple of years prior to that, but my time in the Marketo community specifically really was in that that late 2017, early 2018 period. So I can tell you a little bit about kind of before then. We've got you know some some vintage Marketo logos here, um, and and so what happened in that period of time, and then kind of talking about the the evolution of the user group community since the time of um, of kind of rebooting virtually. So I think the first piece is to kind of just mention, you know, what is a Marketo uh, virtual user group? Um, so, you know, key characteristics of a Marketo user group in general is, is there are meeting, meetings for Marketo users. So oftentimes they're, they're monthly. Um, some, some user groups will do them, you know, uh, quarterly, um, but they're, they're usually no, no less frequent than that. Uh, and they're usually around social and or learning events. So um, different user group leaders do it differently and they're, they're organized in different cities. So the Seattle user group does things a little bit differently than the Houston one, than you know, what we do here in Charlotte, uh, than you know, what happens in, in New York. Um, and so you'll see kind of just uh, different ways of being able to run them. There's no right or wrong way to be able to do it. It's more of a matter of personal preference. And it's usually driven by all the Marketo users within that given geography that get together and, and, and sort of compare notes on it. Uh, in the virtual side of things, so we're not organized by cities. Uh, really, you know, our territory is planet Earth. Um, so, so WebEx, GoToMeeting, and Zoom are really your, uh, your tools of the trade to be able to kind of get everybody together. Um, there's also a promotional piece of it. So, so one of the big challenges is that uh, when, you're, when you have that broad a geography, uh, who do you reach out to? Who do you promote your user group to? Well, it's everybody who's a Marketo user. Well, how do you reach that audience? Um, you know, ideally it's through Marketo and I th those capabilities are available now, but keep in mind that they weren't really that available back in 2017 and 2018. We didn't really have, um, you know, user groups were uh, more of an ancillary meeting that you'd have that'd be above and beyond uh, what, uh, what, what happens uh, uh, in the in the, the, the in-person user group meetings. Um, so 
uh, we had a primer session back in the middle of, of 2018 on this where, you know, Marketo used to host these learning sessions that different user group leaders would have. And Taylor Enfinger, who was the virtual mug ambassador back then, and I believe she's one of the co-leaders of the North American virtual uh, mug, uh, and I did a presentation and a series of slides just on um, how, to, how to run a virtual user group and what we were doing back then. And so I highly recommend that you visit that. I'm going to post those on my company blog, which is conversionstore.com slash blog. Um, and so we'll, we'll make that available for you to be able to kind of get a link and be able to watch that, uh, that session. And I'll put some other links in there too, um, which I'm going to reference later on about, you know, how to conduct some of the, the, the discussions um, and some of the resources around that. So, Prior to 2017, uh, you know, when I got into the community, uh, the state of affairs was this. We had virtual user groups. They were really more, uh, again, there as, as sort of support pieces. So there was a, there was a manufacturing group. Um, there was a, a, a finance. Uh, there was, the slide says healthcare. There was a higher ed one, if I remember correctly, that existed, but they hadn't had any posts or content on them uh, in, 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 if I remember correctly, about a year to a year and a half. I may be wrong on that, forgive me if I am, but um, the only active virtual user group uh, that, that I saw when I got in there was with the Microsoft Dynamics one, and I think that's Dan Stevens and um, Paul Wilson were running, were running that one. And I don't know what the current state of that is. I think it's still active, but um, you know, so a, a, a heavy emphasis on uh, discussion board content and, and that was very heavily focused on a very niche topic, which was, you know, setting up the uh, MS Dynamics connector with Marketo and, you know, what the best practices were for being able to pass data from your Marketo instance to your Dynamics instance and vice versa. Um, really liked the content that I saw in there from the technical depth and the, uh, the amount of people that were involved in it. Um, one of the things that I noticed, you know, and I'm looking at this initially as a newcomer kind of going, okay, well, what can I add for extra value to my, to my group as we're getting started out? And so one of the things that I noticed uh, in the manufacturing group, when I looked at that and the, the old presentations that existed, um, were that, that most of our content, it looked a lot like a webinar. Um, it was very much uh, one or two subject matter experts having a, a conversation amongst themselves uh, with a, a slide deck that they had prepared that was very kind of centric to, to uh, either their company or their expertise. Um, and I didn't really uh, get a sense that there was a lot of, of, of open interactivity and you know what, what? One of my big learning points that I've I've picked up in Marketo has been watching all of those webinars from uh, Mike Madden and, and the content that he produces. And I had a hard time differentiating from you know what we saw in the user group community from that. And I think that that's really important. So my next slide is actually about um, you know that that content and, and how we differentiate, kind of a positioning chart, if you will. Um, and so, so really the way that we think about this, and this may have evolved a little bit, um, I, I'm sure if you, I do not represent Marketo or Adobe, and I think it's really important to mention that I'm just a you know, third party user. I don't speak on behalf of those brands. If you talk to somebody of those brands, they might have a different representation of this. But I looked at this, at, at the content that we're trying to create from two different dimensions. And one is, you know, is this user content driven or is this Marketo content driven? And are we building something that's collaborative or are we building something that's really based around an individual? The presentation I'm doing right now is a very individual one. I'm talking to you and what I wanted to do from a, mark, from, from a mug, what I think is important so that you want people to have buy-in, you want that sense of community. Community does not mean that you have one single threaded voice. Community means that you have um, a dialogue of different voices that are each contributing to an ongoing conversation and that the sum of the sum is great. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, and, and, you know, really, I think that that's an important piece. And so we'll talk a little bit about how we're, we kind of differentiated that out. When we talk about the reboot, but essentially that's, you know, this is a, a pretty important piece that we thought about in 2018 is how do you, how do you have your point of differentiation? So this takes us to 2018 and kind of the reboot. So I come in and we uh, we really decide, okay, well let's 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 think about how we're going to change this up. Um, 
I think it's really important to understand that you're going to make mistakes early on. Um, I paused for maybe about one or two months before doing my first session. Uh, I, I, you know, always had this sort of perfectionist kind of voice in the back of my head going, oh, I don't think this is exactly right. And I think that the important thing to kind of take into account is here, and actually Jeff Canada, I'm glad you're on this because the mistakes that we talked about in your 2019 summit session, you know, about what you learned from those, that very much was the same sort of mindset that I, I, I felt coming into starting your own virtual user group. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, just openly ex understood, hey, we're going to make some mistakes early on. Let's learn from those. And part of why we're doing this session is that we don't make those again or that I can share those with you. So uh, rebooted, focused on uh, kind of manufacturing content. We didn't have the um, other virtual user group sessions. And, and we didn't have, you know, if you look at Marketo's user base, uh, there is a manufacturing component. It is not as large as some of the other verticals that, that, that use the software. Um, and so, you know, to that end, really, the initial content we had really started with software as a service companies or launch point partners um, and uh, in, in different high level uh, service consultants that I have worked for or worked with in previous years. Um, and then over time, as we built more of an audience, that content started to evolve to become closer to the manufacturing space. Um, so, you know, instead of using webinars, uh, kind of a big piece is we didn't sign up for like go to webinars or zoom webinar sessions or, or, you know, uh, Citrix webinars, we signed up for a, a, a Zoom, uh, the video calls that you're seeing right now. And the idea is that, that everybody has an open mic. Um, you can cut in if you, if you want to, if that's part of the session, and that that plurality of discussions makes for a better, uh, better piece over time. And, and it also gives everybody ownership so it's not top down. Um, I really dislike hubris in a lot of these, um, uh, these conversations and engagements that I come into. Um, and, uh, and I prefer people to just be open and honest and, and kind of helpful on these sort of things. Um, so, so definitely kind of coming at this from a video session, and then we'll go into some of the content later on. Um, let's talk a little bit about challenges in 2018. Member interaction was a really challenging part. So as I mentioned to you earlier on, uh, we had limited ways to be able to communicate with the Marketo user base uh, to be able to build awareness that we have virtual user groups and then to explain to people how they can participate in them. Uh, the old software that powered Marketo community, um, it, you know, was great for forums, was great for blog posts. Um, when it came to doing events, there were certain features that were good for events, but there were some drawbacks that we ran into as we were starting to use that. So I had, you know, issues that came up where I, I couldn't communicate to some of the people that had our SVPDS. Um, I had issues where some of the graphical content, if I wanted to put on an infographic or I wanted to use graphical headers, um, I would post it up into the post and then find it missing, uh, you know, a couple of weeks or a month later. Um, so little technical glitches like that, that kept having to be fixed. And a new system that's been in place over the past several months now has really solved a lot of those issues. Um, and it gives you the ability to be able to communicate out to the broader base and still keep the privacy that, you know, Marketo, uh, Marketo customers uh, are entitled to as, as being in that system. So um, that was a big piece. It, it wasn't that, that Marketo didn't want to help us. It's that they, you know, data governance, so you had to be respectful of those privacy concerns. Um, and so, so, you know, that's a piece that's been solved since then. Um, but that's an important piece in terms of being able to kind of grow to scale. So we didn't have that, you know, we used a lot of LinkedIn. Um, if you look at the in-person groups and maybe some of your groups use meetup.com, meetup's really well situated for regional mugs. Uh, very difficult to kind of, or a little bit more so difficult to be able to, to own a space of the broader community around Marketo users. Um, and then the other piece on this is frequency. So we do monthly meetings. Um, one of the things I really liked about the dynamics group that I, I've never really been able to replicate in our group was being able to have people post content uh, between those meetings. So they had a better discussion board group that you really, and I think you see that in the Slack channels now that you'll see uh, from the, the um, MOPS uh, groups and, and different groups like that that exist nowadays where, you know, people are posting almost every day about different challenges that they have and you have that open kind of resource to be able to draw upon. Um, so I, I would point you to those for now. 
biggest piece that I want to take away here for uh, for for group values right now um, is in, in one of the guiding pieces that I put into kind of the philosophy of my group to help kind of keep open dialogue here is just these four different values and um, as JD Nelson actually told me this once in, in one of his sessions is that you know I uh, know one of us is smarter than all of us. So, so trying to keep that safe place to learn. If you've ever been in one of my sessions, you'll see I always have this slide up that has pieces right away for everybody in the, uh, in the user group to realize you can openly ask a question. You will not be ridiculed. I think, you know, one of the most um, uh, disheartening moments that I've ever had was I posted up a question once that was obvious to somebody else and they gave me the, oh, my face. And, you know, I, I'm sure they meant, you know, it didn't mean any malice against it, but, but to me, I really kind of withered back a little bit and kind of said, am I supposed to know that? You know, maybe I should have, but, um, but the point is, is that if you don't ask the question, it, it becomes even harder to really learn the answer and be a better Marketo practitioner, which is the ultimate goal of all of this. Um, so, so really want to keep this kind of a collaborative fun session, uh, very strong emphasis on not making it salesy. Um, but, um, but you know, there's, there's a component in there where we're all trying to learn to be able to serve our clients better, whatever client means to you. Um, I always try and do a roll call right away early on. So um, it, the earlier that you can get people to speak out and become engaged, um, I think the better. Uh, I try and do a little bit of discussion before we hit record on the session so that we all kind of get into the same spot and we're, um, you know, we understand uh, what we're, we're, we're doing from, uh, from that standpoint. Um, and uh, uh, and, and, you know, I think that the other piece is that if, if somebody starts the discussion uh, talking and having a discussion with you earlier on, when they do have a question, it makes them more likely to be able to, to, um, to, to speak up. Um, you know, I always, I was in theater in high school back in the day, just to tell you something personal about myself. And I think that that's a piece of this too, is to, 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 to take something beyond personal. Um, and I always remember having a drama teacher say to me, if you can make eye contact with one or two people in the audience, uh, or, you know, just kind of focus on a smaller piece. If you have 400 people that are out there um, and you really focus on those one or two people that you have a personal rapport with before starting your session, it helps you to avoid things like stage fright. Um, but it also helps them in a way too, to be able to kind of say, oh, I have a personal relationship with that person. I can ask that question without fear. Um, and then one of the pieces that came up, and you'll see this on the recording on the blog post I'm going to send to you from the 2018 session. So some of the Marketo user group leaders were asking questions, and, and you know, there was kind of um, a concern that the, you know, how do the virtual user groups and the, the city-based, the regional user groups coexist without, let's say, one cannibalizing another's, uh, uh, you know, meeting. Um, that is always a risk and it is a possibility if your meetings coincide with each other on the same day and time. However, I always keep these things recorded and then we'll re, re, um, reproduce them onto a YouTube channel that I have set up for the manufacturing mug. And, um, and so they can come back to them otherwise. But I think that the greater piece is, is not cannibalization, but it's brand awareness. There's, there was a, a real struggle to get awareness that user groups exist. We didn't have the kind of placement that, that the user groups now have inside of the Marketo community. Um, and so at the beginning of your slides, as you're making that transition to virtual, if, if you think about it, kind of like you would like a clickstream path. You know how when marketing design uh, in website design, we don't want to end on a PDF that doesn't have any sort of links or, or is it like a dead end, if you will, right? If you, you, you have a piece of gated content and you just deliver somebody that gated content and take over your screen, well, that's a dead end. Where do they click to to stay on your site to keep engaged? I, I think that the, the mug community is a lot like that in the virtual sense as well too, is you want to be able to guide people if you like this session, here's a whole stream of other, other sessions that you can attend as well. So we always had this slide in and this came from the 2018 session. And we always put that at the very beginning so that people have that uh, as sort of a quick plug and you say that within like a minute or two of the beginning of your session. 
Uh, and then the other piece that came out of this, so, so the content evolved over time. Um, after we nailed down the format correctly, we started playing around with what sort of other content we could deliver in the space. So, you know, Jessica Cow had this idea of a, a, a MarTech book club um, and really kind of ran with that afterwards. So she and I and Brooke Bartos and Christina Zenega and Helen Abramova uh, from, you know, all different leaders in the MUB community really got together afterwards and really took ownership of this. And we, you know, I'm, I'm going to revive this now with everything that's happening here. This seems like a good way to be able to spend our time. Um, and uh, we had met once a quarter. Um, we did a great session on um, uh, the CEO of SAP, Bill McDermott, uh, and the the biography that he had. We, this was our second book. We wanted going to do a third one and, and so on. Um, and so we'll revive this. But basically, you know, I think that there's an opportunity to be able to not just have these learning sessions, but also have you know, there's, there's happy hours that you can technically have. Um, there's, there's all sorts of other types of formats that you can have, um, you know, basic interests or things like that. If you want to do maybe a heads down coding session or something like that, um, you know, be creative. Um, and so in that light, you know, we, I really have hosting a manufacturing mug, but I'm putting a lot of of, of broadband content, you know, content about basic marketing concepts. We did video marketing, we did um, email deliverability as topics. Um, and as we got on, then, you know, I started getting kind of reaching out to different people who'd be prospective perspect, pers speakers. Um, and to that content of kind of having interactivity, started to do panel discussions. So, you know, we'd have discussions on this manufacturing panel, which were a group of three kind of prominent manufacturing firms that are using Marketo uh, in the Marketo community. Um, you know, Carissa, for example, went on to be a Fearless 50 member uh, after this was done. Um, and all three of them, you know, had we had a nice discussion really kind of getting into this. One of the learning points I'll share with you behind the scenes of this is I learned that it it's harder when you have more people involved because you have to be, you have brevity in terms of time. And I didn't know this when I did this session. I'll, the next slide I'll show you is the one we did before, uh, for, before Summit in 2019. But I noticed that um, there was content that came through from some of these speakers where they, they had, some of them had teams and were very well versed on being able to manage groups in Marketo. And, and honestly, we could have had an individual session for them. Um, it's important that you prep your speakers on the virtual platform because you can't have uh, other people chime in from the audience while they're trying to present content. Zoom will just move you to those people, to those people. It'll sound like one garbled mess. Um, and so it's important that you kind of say, prep these speakers in advance to say, I need you to make sure that you're muted when other people are not, are, are when you're not speaking so that Zoom doesn't accidentally pick up your audio or feedback and put you on camera when you're not talking at somebody else that's talking. Um, and, and that became even more of an issue when we did the, the pre-show presentation. So, you know, Jeff Canada, you're on here right now. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this towards the end. But, um, you know, if you notice, you know, we had more speakers that were on here. Um, I, I will dig up the email that I sent to you and all the other speakers beforehand, but I had a set of bullet points that I sent to everybody. And so we had tricks that were there behind the scenes that if you were going on too long, uh, you know, I would give you a, ver a vis visible cue, something like this, to be able to say you're, or you're going too long um, so that you knew to cut it short without having to rudely interrupt you. Um, that was a trip. Um, I had other pieces where uh, the, the audio portion, you know, being able to mute and unmute yourself. Um, and then also uh, just being able to talk about bandwidth and checking some of your audio capabilities ahead of time. So I'll try and dig that one up and I'll put that in the blog article as well too. Um, I want to pause here for a second too, and then just check, you know, Jeff, did you, I mean, do you remember that session? Did you have any pieces that, that maybe you could share as well on this too, that, um, um, you know, might be, uh, uh, or highlights that you remembered from that discussion that you thought kind of worked out really well? Yeah. You know, I think it was just a, it was a shift in the way that, that, you know, we were normally kind of thinking through how to give a presentation like that. Um, uh, it, the practice and the the preparation that we did for summit in general was just kind of you know with people in the room and I think particularly now it's it's really it's really interesting to think through how do we keep people engaged 
through Zoom, through these kinds of other other things. I think, you know, there's little things like you were just mentioning, like, you know, you hate to be like, hey, by the way, you're, you're over time. You know, if there's, if there's different types of cues and things to think through, um, I think those are things that are becoming extremely evident uh, right now. Like even I moved chairs really quickly from where we started and I'm really backlit. That's a really shitty experience for poor experience for people um so there's there's a lot of different little things that i think uh you know it's important for us to think through in this kind of new uh, new normal that we're in yeah yeah so one of the things that i want to mention too and we just you 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 won't notice it watching the video of this if you're watching from home well ever all of you are watching from home but anyway uh i turn off the screen share when i get into a discussion with jeff and I do it uh, briefly and then turn it back on afterwards when I go to my content so that Zoom goes into a full screen mode of the video side of things. And it makes it kind of cut back and forth. It makes it look like it's something that's being kind of professionally produced. I mean, let's, let's face it, right? I don't have a director with like a soundboard and a video board behind me trying to, to cut these things back and forth, but you can sort of, sort of fake that by, by being able to kind of turn these, the, the screen share on and off and using some of Zoom's inherent features to be able to cut back and forth based on who's talking, for example. So in that session we had with five different speakers, it was great because, um, you know, in addition to the five, uh, Jeff Krajewski, Kevin Weisenberger from the Healthcare Virtual Mug were monitoring the chat room. So it's good to kind of have a split in terms of, of rules or responsibilities um, to be able to help you to have success in that and to plant a couple of questions, for example, to kind of get the user, uh, the, the discussion board going. Uh, and, and then I think the last piece that I want to mention too, that's kind of a tip and the trick is, um, some of your people are afraid to talk in a recorded context because maybe they're asking a question that they want to know personally um, and are you know, ashamed to bring that up, et cetera. There's a variety of different reasons why that might happen. Uh, if you offer your, your Q&A session in a recorded session and then offer an unrecorded one where people can talk freely without, without being recorded, I've always found that the unrecorded ones after we started offering that, people would be more involved in that. You'd say things that you normally wouldn't say on camera. Um, you know, I, for example, I, when I go to a conference, I, I rarely book the, the hotel room. That's the, the booked block. I usually in Vegas, I'll, I like to stay at treasure Island because I find to get a better deal across the street. And, um, it has a lot of the same amenities that, that I would use anyway. Um, I don't mind walking the extra distance. You know, do I normally talk about that in public? Not really. Um, but, but, you know, it, it's a piece that's if the same thing. If you ask a question that, that might be a basic question in Marketo, um, you know, you might learn that answer later on. So you don't want people to think, oh, I don't know that answer. Your audience member might think that. Um, and, and, and the last thing you want is just that recording to kind of put them off. And if you think, well, I'm losing something in my recording, actually you're not. So one of the things that we would do is have that last slide that would say, okay, now we're going to a live Q&A session. If you want to participate in that, join us in the next mug meeting so that you can be a live participant and actually brings up our live presenta uh, presentation numbers. You know, having an on-demand audience is really great. If you have a live audience, it's even better because it means that you have better discussions that are kind of coming into the piece. Um, okay, so let me jump back in terms of, of next slides here and move along. So virtual mugs today, um, you know, Amy, I'm going to tag you in on this too, because I, again, I, I really think that you can speak a little bit more to what's happened. I, I've been, uh, again, in the background on some of the, uh, the virtual mugs that have happened since then, but, but you know, what I've, what I've witnessed more has been more of a mainstream um, acceptance of virtual mugs. I think that they have, have grown to kind of exist, coexist independently of the, uh, the, the, the regional, the, the, ge the geographic mugs. Um, I've seen more of the larger uh, launch point, uh, you know, uh, the, some of the more senior launch point partners and service providers have become involved in them um, and have, have sort of backed them. And I think that that's produced greater content um, and a greater following as you have more marquee names that are kind of involved in the, uh, in, the, in the virtual user group community. So I think it's grown a lot. I think that the 
uh, enhancements that the Marketo marketing team has brought in terms of launching that new uh, platform where we can, um, you know, we can freely email uh, people that are that are our members and um, are in the broader Marketo community. I've noticed the RSEPs and the I'm, I'm doing a session a week from now about the value of analytics. Uh, I've gotten a lot more RSEPs. Uh, than I've ever had using the old system, and just by leveraging some of the, uh, the 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 platform that they've implemented. So that's looking really positive for me. I'm looking forward to seeing what that's going to be like next week. Amy, what's your experience been like? Um, so yeah, I've joined the North America VMUG, which I think is a nice way to connect with people across the country. And then whether or not you have your own mug, obviously I have San Francisco mug, but you know there's people in that who. I don't get a chance to talk to <clears throat> very often and I get to meet new people. Um, and also I agree that I'm super excited about the new Bevy portal because we don't have to rely on Marketo as a bottleneck to send out those emails. I think it's been um, a little bit challenging to get people onto Bevy. Um, we've had one, <laughs> we scheduled one meeting on Bevy and then um, we had to cancel that meeting because um, of uh covid <laughs> but uh you know at least i feel like it was a good push to get people on it i think that's the number one challenge is getting people on the platform but then once we do i think it should be really um easier to get them to rsvp mm -hmm. yeah yeah um and i and i did notice that the nav mug that they did what you're talking about about like part of it was recorded and then part of it um the q a was unrecorded which i thought again was a nice nice way yeah so people can ask that they don't want like preserved for all time <laughs> right yeah no i definitely i definitely felt that as well too like i definitely i i you know it's been great to see what they've done it's, it's great to see that you know some of the pieces that we were doing back in the you know the 2018 period are still being used today um so that, that's really validating but i think that that more has been brought to it like one of the things that i've seen in bevy that i uh plan to make use of that I, I haven't yet is they have I've noticed that there's a field in there to be able to put your Facebook pixel um, in, inside of that so you can do some remarketing I think that there's a big opportunity for that I think that um, I have had more success historically from LinkedIn than I did the old Marketo uh, uh, community system um, I'm not sure if that's going to be true now. I, 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 you know, the RSCPs that I've had come in here in the last couple of weeks have been uh, kind of on par with what I was getting off of LinkedIn historically. Um, so, how I, did you get people into Bevy in the first place? Did you have Marketo send out an email? Yeah. Were you just I, recruiting with your LinkedIn group? No, I did. Um, so. I, I've still separated them out initially. I had uh, uh, sent a couple of emails through Bevy. Um, so Kelsey had, had you know, helped me to guide through, okay, here's, here's where you set up your emails. I, I watched the recording that she and the Bevy team had done. Um, and that has been mostly it. I actually haven't had to do too much work other than send out emails and write up some copy. Um, I am getting responses off of LinkedIn as well. Um, but my LinkedIn, so I, I usually set up my Zoom meetings to have a registered link like you, you know, like we, we did for this session here. And I used, I've been using that as my landing page. I'm going to change that a little bit and I'm going to have landing pages based off of my own website as well too um, in the future. But I think it's important to have that parallel, you know, understand kind of an omni-channel sort of a, a, a viewpoint that you'll have people that will prefer to register through the Bevy portal. Um, you may have people that will register outside of there. Um, I think if you start to kind of give multiple options to people and, and have that flexibility to say, um, you know, work with, work with the, the, the media preferences of your audience instead of trying to force media preferences to them, I think that will give you better response. And once they in, engage and kind of get involved in the user group, they'll start to learn to, to see, well, who are all these other people that are in the discussion that I've, I've never met before? I don't see them on, let's say the LinkedIn uh, community group. And then you'll just or, or naturally organically over time, get grow awareness of that. And it'll be less work for you to be able to make that transition uh, when you can kind of see, okay, I, I have yeah. the audience in Bevy. Plus I also have all of those other Marketo user group resources that are already hooked in there. 
And, uh, you know, I think that that's a, a, a better value proposition for people than just going on LinkedIn and hoping to skim for the next Marketo, you know, user group that comes up that you have that in one succinct spot that shows you here's all of the Marketo user groups. Um, actually, that is my next slide is, is, is like this, that, you know, this viewpoint is more valuable to, um, to a Marketo administrator than having to skim through a social media channel to try and find content that's relevant to you. You don't want to be looking at another marketing automation. Uh, well, maybe you do, but, but ideally you want to be able to, to, to find the content that's specifically focused towards Marketo. Um, and, and I think this is kind of a unique value proposition that this is kind of the only place where you're really going to be able to find um, kind of the whole uh, cumulative, collectively exhaustive group of Marketo, uh, Marketo user groups to, to participate in. If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I like highlighting the other, <clears throat> other, I think especially now, I would think about um, highlighting other virtual sessions that like my members can attend. Like, look, there's NAV mug, or like if you're in manufacturing and healthcare, whatever those virtual groups are. Yeah. Um, I was also thinking when you when you said that you try not to be backlit, I remembered that when I, I think I presented the NAV mug after summit, they asked me to be on a post summit panel. I think it was pre summit either way. Uh, and no, it was post summit. And I wore a shirt with very narrow stripes, which looks terrible on camera, which I should know because I used to be in PR, um, but I completely forgot. And so I feel like I'm kind of taking notes of like things I would remember to tell a speaker. Like if you can try not to be backlit, if you can try not to wear a small pattern or narrow stripe. Um, so it's like those little things that are different. Whereas like what I wear in person doesn't matter as much. I like that you mentioned that. So I, uh, one of the points that, that I um, wanted to bring up here is, is to come at these virtual Marketo user groups with a broadcast journalist mindset. And um, I have a post that was in the Marketo user group, secret uh, Marketo user group, which I'm going to share in my blog post uh, that I'm going to do after this, where I had two different video interviews that I had pulled up on YouTube. And one was with Katie Couric and the other one was with Larry King. And, and it was about how to be able to conduct, you know, concise interviews. I noticed from the session that I had with the manufacturing panel, the first one, I felt like my questions could have been better. And I've noticed in some of my sessions, if you look at them, I, 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 I asked a couple of really good questions. I had other ones that when I got the answers back or, or the way that I phrased the question, it, it, it sort of came off as filler. I didn't feel like there, I, the value of those questions was as good. And uh, one of the things, so the, the quick takeaway that I got from these Larry King and Katie Couric interviews was don't ask people about the obvious questions, you know, you say, well, when is this event happening? What is this event about? Um, you know, people can read through the Marketo docs to talk about, uh, to talk about how to do, you know, real-time personalization, let's say, or something like that. Uh, it's more interesting. It makes for a better interview if you ask people about their experiences, their insights, um, how they feel about, uh, 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 about doing a specific task. You know, um, a really simple example that, that probably everybody can talk to is, you know, when you, let's say you're talking about like landing page design, you're talking about CRO, right? Um, what do you look at when you look at a landing page aesthetically, right? Where, where do you, you know, everybody talks about kind of that F diagram, how your eyes go, you know, top to bottom, left to right. Um, you know, but, but tell me, tell me what, what influences you, for example, right? What, what, what designers do you really like? What, what brands do you think do a really good job of design? Um, those are uh, opinion-based questions. And you take a, uh, you know, a topic like that, that, that could be just drive, you know, what colors do you think were, are great? What's, you know, what, what, what font sizes do you use? And to make it something that's more personal, that, that makes more emotional, more evocative. Um, and, and, you know, that's what I got out of those interviews. I'll post those up in, in just those YouTube videos. Um, but if you Google those and, and if you, you know, look at other broadcast journalists and, and, and try and do those behind the scenes uh, conversations, um, think of like into the actor's studio and, and, and have them talk and, and try and look at it from that point of view. I think that that's more important, especially in the virtual platform, because 
you have less things in your meetings that all the eyes are on you because there's nothing else for them to be on. There's no, you know, you don't have a, somebody sitting next to you that you can whisper um, questions to or pass notes to, or, you know, go to the back of the room to the wine and cheese bar and, and, and sort of network or socialize that that doesn't exist in a virtual standpoint. So, you know, you, you have to think of it more like you're on television. And, and I think that that's an important yeah. I like that. Um, I wanted to ask you about facilitating discussion. Like, I think the one thing that I miss um, in a virtual mud versus in person is that, like casual chit chat and like getting quiet people to talk. Um, how do you facilitate group discussion and how do you replace the like sort of casual networking yeah. discussions that people normally have? So I have a couple of different ideas. I haven't, I haven't honestly implemented those to, to my satisfaction level, but I have a couple of ideas in, in terms of how to do it. So the, the first one is, um, and, and one of the things that I saw Michael Guzman do here in, in Charlotte is he has a good mix of um, theoretical user group sessions and then casual ones where, you know, where you kind of go to a bar or a restaurant and you're, you're socializing more. You don't even really talk shop. It's more just socializing. Uh, the challenge that you have with the social aspect of it is that really only one person at a time or maybe two can talk, even two, it's kind of limited, can talk on Zoom without it becoming garbled noise. But there's a feature in Zoom that allows you to do breakout rooms. You just need the Zoom Pro version. You don't even need the enterprise version or anything like that. But you set up breakout rooms afterwards. And what I, you know, I offered this once I didn't, it was earlier on, I didn't have enough people to really make it happen. But if I had a larger room, if I had, you know, 20 or 30 people, I would, um, you know, I always joke at the book club about those choose your own adventure books where you turn to page 23 and you, you know, see the hero take a left turn down the hallway or take a right turn down the hallway. If you offer those breakout rooms, you as the moderator have the ability to quickly click and say, um, okay, everybody who wants to be in the breakout room talking to presenter A, uh, let me know and I select them and then you have a smaller group of people. So you might have 20 or 30 people, but you can break out four or five people into one room two or three into another room. It's called Zoom breakout rooms. And if you look at mm -hmm. the Zoom health conversation, it'll give you that ability to be able to do that. Yeah, I have seen that feature. I've just never used it. Um, so that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the best way. I think the other thing too is to understand, you know, some of these conversations have to happen offline in a way. So if you, if you have like a Slack channel in parallel, um, I do. think, you know, I love... <laughs> that format and kind of what's been born out of that and kind of the real time on that. And I think, you know, that's, that's probably the best that you can offer from that standpoint is to kind of say, okay, throw that in the chat room, have one of your co present uh, your co-hosts be a moderator of the chat room to help. I, I have a hard time. Maybe it's, you know, the quality of my eyesight, but I, I can't read the zoom chat while I'm no. having, without having to go really close. Zoom chat is terrible. <clears throat> And also like blanks, which I find really distracting. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'd say use both of those. Um, um, okay. Go ahead, and, please. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, do you, when, um, when somebody's presenting, is, do you mute everybody else? Is there a way to do that as a yeah. host? Yeah, you can. So if you, if you, in Zoom, if we're talking about Zoom, if you go to the, yeah. um, the session that t talks about attendees and you click, it's, it's like the second from the left panel or the third from the left panel okay. that talks about manage attendees. So you'll see at the bottom okay. of that screen, there's a mute all button. Um, and okay. if you, if you, if you highlight, if you mouse over your attendees, if some person still unmutes, you actually can mouse over them, hover over them, and you'll see a set of blue buttons that allow you to be able to mute individuals. And you can see if you look at the icons on the right-hand side on that invite button, you know, as they flash green, you can see where that audio is coming from. So if you have a large room okay. of people and you always have that annoying, it, it's, it always seems like it's the loudest background noise in the world and it's coming from one person or they go on, they, they go on God, yeah. hold and you, they're, you're hearing their hold music. You, you know, that's a good way to be able to kind of, you quickly skim the the list and you can see wherever you're seeing the the microphone arrow turn green that's the person that you want to be able to mute without having to mute everybody else if that's what you want to do yeah that's a good idea <clears throat> yeah um 
can I answer any, so this is my last slide and I really love the, the, the questions, the back and forth and to, to that end, right? Like I'll, you know, Jeff, if you have questions as well too. Um, my last piece on this is kind of to our point is, is how do you get people to sign up to the, to, to Bevy, you know, mugs.marketo.com. I would be plastering this all over any marketing collateral that you have around your user groups. Um, and, you know, the blog article I'll put with some of the other external resources that I have like a huge folder in my hard drive that has all these different things over the years. Um, and I think, so I have other pieces too that I'll just reference quickly. So um, Inga Romanov and I uh, had set up a Canva um, account to share uh, marketing collateral for like email templates and things like that. Uh, it's in Marketo's old logo though. So it's, it's kind of dated. Um, but the idea behind it was we wanted to, we have maybe about, maybe about half a dozen, maybe 10 different um, user group leaders back then in it. Um, and the idea was let's build out uh, template content that you can quickly type your content, uh, your, your, you know, the name of your user group and whatever into. I think Bevy replaces all of that, but you know, if you want an invite into it to see what was built out of it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be able to send it to you. I can tell you all the, the, the collateral in it is out of date. Um, but, um, you know, I thought back then it was a pretty good idea for us to be able to kind of, uh, help to streamline that email bottleneck that you were talking about earlier. Um, and, you know, I have a lot of, um, pre-canned presentations that, that I shared with Jeff and Kevin as they were starting the healthcare mug uh, to help get them up and running right away too. So if you want to connect with me like one-on-one, -on -one, I'll put as much as I can into the blog article for that. But if you want to connect with me as well, I'm just putting my, my email in here as well too so that you guys have those. You know, even if it's not a Marketo user group event, I'm, I'm happy to be able to help with that too. I used to run um, a meetup community in Toronto for about four years that had about 4,000 people in it. Uh, so, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of learnings that kind of came from That's that. Awesome. Well. Um, Jeff, um, do I don't have any more questions. Jeff, do you have anything? I don't know. Thank you though. This is super helpful. Okay. Great. Yeah. Uh, I think this gives Jeff and I some good things to think about <clears throat> as we decide what to do for the next, foreseeable future with the SF mug. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Michael, so much for, for putting this together. Um, I really appreciate you doing this live and I know everybody who couldn't attend will um, really appreciate watching the recording. It's given me a lot of inspiration and things to think about. Yeah. Yeah. No, happy, happy to help. And, um, you know, glad to be back. I mean, you guys are, um, yeah. kind of like, like, you know, kind of like the coworkers that I don't have. <laughs> so, um, you know, I really, yes, same you know, especially right yeah. now, right? Like it's, this is, it's really important to kind of be in the, in community oh groups more so than ever right now. So, um, you know, the last thing that we should all be doing is pausing our, our Marketo user groups. I think we should be doing more of them right now because I think people personally will appreciate them a lot more. Absolutely. All right. All right. I'm going to end the meeting, but um, thank you guys for attending and um, uh, look forward to seeing you guys. Uh, uh, mine is, my next one is next Friday for the shameless plug and uh, cool. hope to see you there. Cool. Yeah, Sounds absolutely. Good. All right. All right. Bye guys. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.